Ahmed, Mark's gender, and what it means to be free. Thank you, Rachel. Um, good morning, and thank you to everyone who came out. We just uh, was quickly saying that the turnout's a little bit overwhelming. I had anticipated eight women, and uh, <laughs> we have a nice little chat. So this is absolutely wonderful, and um, I really do begin the, uh, hope that this is the beginning of what will be a really fabulous discussion, not just over this conference, but in, in the upcoming years. Um, in some ways, the, the history of this panel could be, debate, uh, could be dated back to the close of a Rethinking Marxism conference some time ago when I mentioned to Abby that I thought it would be really great if the Marxist-feminist debate could be revived and she could do it. <laughs> uh, so then, you know, fair turnaround, she came back. Uh, she's always been 10 steps ahead and said, yeah, let's do this panel. So I'm very pleased uh, to have accepted that invitation. And when I found out that uh, Johanna and Adrian were also willing to participate, I thought, this is absolutely it. Uh, we've done it. We've revised, revisited. We've fixed. Everything will be great after this. Now all I have to do is sit down and write a paper. This is easy. This is like a thing that will write itself. Uh, I'm just going to do a little bit of a lit review, I tell myself and present some proposals for a renewed debate, and uh, look at the work of Ryan on Avskaya. What could be easier? Uh, well, the paper refused to be written. I have not had such trouble pulling together all of my thinking over what's been, now I realize, 20 years of study, as I did trying to put together speaking notes for this conference, drawing from all of these threads of thought. So I realized, uh, as I started to think about it, that this really means that I had to engage what I meant by saying, looking backward to see ahead. I had believed that this was simply an assertion of a return, that we could fix what was wrong uh, with the previous debates, correct misinterpretations. But I realized quickly that really looking back had to be deeper, sometimes it has to be much more personal, and it had to be much more philosophically engaged than even I originally understood when I threw that title back in an email. It sounded good at the time. In other words, I felt that I had to live up to the second part of the title and articulate why this return is of such paramount importance and why it is about human freedom over everything else. So now, as a result of uh, my own dithering and trying to put myself together, I find that the paper is a series of backward glances, and I intentionally use the word glance because these are going to be very quick snapshot books. I hope they blend my own engagements uh, with philosophical works that will, when we have this expanded discussion, lay the foundation for a new, lively engagement between, maybe not Marxism, but Marx himself and feminist theory. I should make one caveat at the outset of uh, this talk that for a variety of reasons and time being primary, I do not attempt to engage what the word feminist means here. And I know that's an important part of the discussion. Uh, instead, I'm going to recognize the breadth of that debate, its importance, and simply assert that I use it here to mean approaches which are attempting to theorize both women's oppression and their emancipation. Uh, and it's a, I'm not ready to give up the label feminist, that's a whole other paper, probably why I had trouble with this paper, um, but it might come up in discussion. So the first glance backwards that I want to make is to 1997. The day before Halloween, I defended an MA thesis that was entitled, Women's Revolutionary Agency, Reigniting the Marxist Feminist Debate. That was 1997, you can see I was successful. <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> It wasn't the MA that I had ever intended to write. In fact, my intention had been to write about the Nicaraguan Revolution, um, but that became sidelined very quickly as I became engrossed in the literature that emerged from women participants in the Sandinista-led revolt. By the 1990s, as many people here will know, many women who had been participant in that revolution uh, were deeply disappointed by its outcomes. And in fact, Margaret Randall, name common uh, to many of you, I'm sure, entitled her book on the subject, Gathering Rage, 
And at the time, I think I was shocked when she put rage in the title. And then I wanted to rage against Margaret. How could she rage against the Sandinistas? And I had a whole conversation with her. Except in 2012, I think I understand a little bit better the source of her rage. Randall soundly critiqued the revolutions in Nicaragua and Cuba, where she had also been a participant, for failing to develop a feminist agenda. And in these pages of the book were references to what we might say was a more feminist-inclined Marxism. In fact, there was a footnote to the work of a scholar I will talk about, Raya Donerskaya uh, and Adrian Reich. So footnotes are really important. I was hooked but surprised to find that I had already missed the great debate between Marxists and feminists. In fact, its height appeared in the literature to be in the 1980s. Now, really, it's a long decade. I would argue that it begins around 1966, hits at its height probably in 82, 83, peters out a little bit in 85, and then there are some sporadic uh, examples. And I'm thinking here of Juliet Mitchell's uh, Women, the Longest Revolution that came out in 1966 in the Monthly Review, which was quickly followed by Sheila Robotham's Women's Consciousness, Man's World in 1972. These started to set, I think, the parameters of what had been previously known as the woman question at the left. So I found this period was very productive for the women's liberation movement. Uh, it certainly marked the emergence of a new left. And although there is a wide array of theory and debate, it is possible to see that there did emerge um, a coalescence around three kinds of approaches out of that literature. The first approach was to argue that Marxism was too economistic and reductionist to adequately entertain gender as a salient category or to address feminist concerns about women's oppression. And you see that argument is still reproduced in work like Christina uh, De Stefano, for example, more recently. Uh, when I started grad school, you could say Marx, somebody else in the work group would say reductionist, and that was the end of the discussion, and you could move on. It was easy. Except I, as an MA student, didn't know what reductionist meant. <laughs> I was very confused. I would include here also, under this first approach, uh, the category that is really familiar to people, which is the dual systems theory approaches. There were several, but they really attempted to look at patriarchy potentially as a longer historical set of social relationships uh, prior to capitalism, and then to assess how patriarchy and capitalism could come together. There are very many critiques uh, over the dual systems theory, the best known probably by Iris Marion Young at the time. And all of this came together in a very <coughs> famous uh, collection edited by Lydia Sargent, which is Women in Revolution, a discussion of the unhappy marriage between Marxism and feminism in 1981. Quick show of hands, how many people have read that edited volume? It is, it's the, the marker, I think, at the time. Unfortunately, it didn't resolve anything in some ways. The second approach that coalesced, I would loosely call the domestic labor debate, um, and much of this was uh, subsumed under critical considerations of the role of reproductive labor, and people can think of Mary O'Brien's work here as really um, on the cutting edge, and also uh, what was I think Lenin's proposal initially, the wages for housework uh, model, which I have recently seen revisited in South Africa by Jacqueline Koch, who's a very well-known uh, activist and sociologist there. But this work was most epitomized probably by Mary Rosa Della Costa at the time. In simple terms, Wally Seacombe famously described the domestic labor debate as an attempt to generate Marxist answers to feminist questions. And maybe that's really what we're still trying to do. Finally, the third approach, which I would closely align with the work of Lise Vogel, uh, proposed a unification of Marxist and feminist theory. Vogel argued that there were broad areas of inquiry that needed to be answered in both theory and practice, which is very important to me, uh, the unification of those two ideas. And she wanted to look at the root of women's oppression, how can its cross-class and trans-historical character be understood theoretically, what is the relationship of the sexual division of labor to women's oppression, we haven't seen it disappear, 
What is the importance of childbearing capacity as well as actual child rearing? So uh, those have to be understood. And how can class, sex, race oppression be understood and reconciled theoretically? Now I think Vogel's work in the 1980s was some of the most promising, but it was surprising to me in 2005 when Science and Society did a special issue on Marxism and feminism. She co-edited um, but she did not uh, introduce a piece in that uh, journal. So, what? What is this? Okay. Okay, there's, I'm going to combine two glances backwards. I want you to look 1940 and the early 20th century together and talk about how I started to reconcile these disparate approaches between Marxism and feminism. And that was by turning to the work of Raya Donevskaya. Uh, again, quick show of hands, how many people have heard of Donovskaya's work? This is a huge uh, number compared to usually the one or two that I will see in a room. Uh, Donovskaya begins her theoretical uh, work in the 1940s. Uh, she is very firmly and closely eventually tied to a philosophy she calls Marxist humanism, which utilizes uh, Hegel's dialectics uh, as revised by Marx, and then she reads consistently across all of his works. Uh, I, I cannot do any, uh, I, I can't cover her right now in 15 minutes, but let me say that coming to her work uh, led to two very important things. She focused on the notion of post-Marx, Marxism as being a problem. That is, all the works that come beginning with Engels she says, misinterpret, misunderstand Marx's method, and as a result, they uh, have a failure to adequately theorize the revolutionary agent, that is the subject. From her thinking, subjectivity expands, or needs to be thought of in an expansive way beyond class. In fact, I would say you could consider class a kind of container that um, holds other subjectivities. They are revolutionary. In her work, she was very early to identify um, blacks. She worked closely with black movement in the United States. Uh, many of you will know Trotsky and C.L.R. James's arguments about uh, uh, seeing blacks as uh, a liberation movement. So she was closely associated with that. Women's activities within the movement and ultimately youth at the time. As she continued her work in the 1960s and 70s, she also began to include other marginalized expressions such as sexual identity. So I was very inspired by this. The second glance is to Rosa Luxemburg, who is someone that uh, Danuskaya spent some time with uh, and I think is only coming into her own today. How many people think feminist Marxist Rosa Luxemburg in the same sentence? <laughs> Yay! <laughs> no hand <laughs> done. <laughs> I was actually at a, a conference uh, in South Africa where I said Rosa Luxemburg was a feminist and a bunch of academics slammed their book shuts and said she never said that. Well, actually she did say that. She said exactly those words. I guess now I am a feminist. And she spent a lot of her time in the last two months of her life actually looking at how to incorporate women's organization into the emerging new social democratic movement in Germany. In other words, women could not be separated from the revolution. And I think we are just on the cusp of looking at uh, where her work and her thinking about the unity of theory and practice and spontaneous movements can take us. Now, those were two really quick glances backward that uh, hopefully we'll have time, time to think about. Uh, so I wanted to close with three sort of general proposals that I would hope would lay the foundation for a new engagement between feminists and uh, Marxists. In this regard, as I said to Abby, uh, I will do the universal. There's some particulars and individuals that are going to happen. And hopefully, Abby will uh, take us back to uh, some more provocative thinking. So really, three simple things. Uh, at least, I think they're simple. The first is to take seriously the work of Marx. And I'm indebted to a forthcoming book by Heather Brown in this regard, where she has gone back into Marx's writings, uh, both journalistic and theoretical, to examine how gender was actually conceptualized. This has taken her into a very close reading of uh, 
his ethnological notebooks as well, which we could talk about uh, in the discussion. Uh, this builds also on some work by Kevin Anderson. His recent work, Marx at the Margins, I think is another good way to take Marx seriously. It also means excising angles, origins of private property. And some people might feel an attachment to that, so we should talk about it. The second is engage the works of Luxembourg and Deniskaya. I think women are often very absent in feminist theoretical literature. That is, women who theorized, who were active. And I think there's a great deal to mine. Uh, from their work. And finally, and in closing, the third proposal is to remember it's about freedom. That ultimately, the challenge to us is to theorize an emancipatory project that sees social agents as the creators of self-determined freedom. And I think we lost a lot of that in the 1980s debate. So, uh, now there's many papers to be written. <laughs> Thank you.